Good morning, Vice Chancellor. Good morning. Or good evening to you. Good evening to you. That's it. Uh, mine is six thirty. Uh, yours is yes. what? What is the time now in in New York? Um, it should be ten. It should be nine o'clock morning. Nine a.m. So it's not very early morning for you, I guess. Uh, no, it's not that early. Yeah. Yeah, I know because you know I I know that you tend to get up early in the morning to complete eh? your studies. Yes, that's the old old habit, you know. Like us, you know. I remember my <laughs> parents used to say, "Early to bed, early to rise, make you healthy and wise." Yes, of course, the great old saying. Great that's old right. saying. Yeah. Anyway, good to see you. Was, uh, likewise, very, likewise. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm I'm I should be thankful to your teacher, Professor Jagdish Bhagwati. In yes. fact, I, I uh, got you through him. <laughs> uh, I just yeah, wrote no. to him because I didn't know how to approach you because yes. um, given your you know schedule and given your kind of commitment to various kinds of activities, I don't know whether you would have had time to address us at Vishwa Bharati. So then I approached Professor no, no. Bhagwati. You know, he's my mentor. You know, for quite he some time, he's a great, he great man. mentor. Great, great soul. He's a great yes. soul. Yes. Yes. In fact, yes. you know, this time we suggested, um, you know, a kind of an honorary doctorate for him. But because of this corona pandemic, the prime minister you know, told me just uh, hang on for the time being, because he came, <laughs> but he came virtually, so right. he wanted to come physically and yes. hand over the the award to both uh, Professor Bhagwati and Madam Desai. Yes, so, uh, that's our plan. But you know, uh -huh. you couldn't disclose it because it is approved by the prime minister's office. Well, and then you know, then it is openly, publicly declared. Okay. So that's our plan. That's the plan. But I'm sure. Very good, excellent. Once that is over, the pandemic is over, we'll have Professor Bhagwati here. And of course, you know, I made an earnest request, make an earnest request to you to come down <laughs> to Vishwabharati, because to yes. have you is a great honor for us. Uh, no, no, we will do that. Anagari, so. Yeah. So no, no, anyway, I'm glad that uh, we got you. You know, for Vishwabharati, because Vishwabharati, as you know, is a is a you know is known. Otherwise, but of course, but of course, most of the academicians neglect it as it's a very rural, remote, you know, <laughs> not very dazzling kind of academic center in India. Even I mean, if you had it been JNU, mm. DU, yeah. things would have been a little different. But Vishwamitra, yeah. as you know, it's in the periphery. Mm, yeah. But, but anyway, but, I'm really thankful. We are very, very thankful to you, Professor Panagaria, that you know you agreed to give us a talk, and a lot of us are really uh, waiting keenly. To listen to you. No, not at all, sir. And Professor you know, Bhagwati is a long time, uh, uh, it's, he's a very long time mentor as well as good friend. So that's right. You know, he talks I, very fondly of you. He, he mean, you know, even before you wrote to me, huh. uh, he had, uh, he and I had talked about you quite, and he spoke thank very, you very much. Thank you very much. You know. And I saw, you know, you cited my work, I think, in, I think Nehru's planning. The, Yes, in yes. The books you refer to that you know article which was published in Modernization Studies. Yes, yes, yes. He, he wrote about the article. He was very happy. But he said, I wanted you to write even a kind of a long essay on that. Hmm. But somehow the other, you know, it wasn't possible then. Then I lost interest, so I did something else. Ah, okay. I mean, that is what <laughs> happens, you know. I'm, I'm very, <laughs> I don't want to be a person who knows too much of too little. I want to let, know more, you know. Yes. So uh, I keep shifting. You know, now I'm working on Rabindranath Tagore. I mean, recently okay. I published a book in November. Sage published it on the social and political thought of uh, Rabindranath Tagore. Rabindranath Tagore. Very uh, lovely. So that's lovely. published. Now I'm working on three Tagores. You know, Dwarkanath, Devendranath, and Rabindranath. Oh, nice. And I'm trying to capture the you know socio-political history of Bengal slash India uh, from the point of view of their biography. Lovely, lovely. You are unlike other vice chancellors in India, you know. Most vice chancellors retire from doing their academic yeah. work once they are vice chancellors. 
Uh, yeah, that's right. No, Professor Parangani, I don't know whether you agree with me. I mean, the, the same thing I saw in the US. I taught in Virginia University for three mm -hmm. years. And there, you know, I know the grading. Whenever grading comes, you know, the teachers, you know, become so busy, even yeah. they don't meet their friends. Yeah. So I said, but here you assess only 30, 40 papers. But in India, we assess 500 papers. Yet we <laughs> maintain all relations. Yeah. So you know, there I wrote a book on uh, Martin Luther King and uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And that was published by OUP in New York. Um, because I, I, I believe that though they didn't meet when Mahatma Gandhi was alive, yet mm -hmm. if you think in terms of their thought processes, yeah. I mean, they uh, had more or less identical, you know, approach to mm. humanity, universalism. Right. So that's uh, the title of my book is Confluence of Thought. And I'll, sh I'll show you the book. Okay. This is the book. Ah, very nice. Yes. This is a, I mean, they brought out um, the initial the uh, hardbound. Now it's the paperback. Ah. Uh, so this is uh, the New York one, the latest figure. Uh, This is the Tigor book. Oh, nice. Very nice cover. Uh, this is Tigor book. Very nice cover. And okay. last year, I also had this book, you know. Um, wow, you really are very prolific. Uh, so this is the one because, you know, I I, I, uh, I, I agree. I don't know whether you agree with Oh, Jinnna Savarkar and Ambedkar. That's right. Yeah, this is the one, people. you know. Because you know, <laughs> I, I strongly feel that unless you understand these three, you know, um, I think thinkers or ideologues yeah. is yeah. very difficult to understand in the, the development of contemporary India. I mean, you tend to focus on Gandhi and Nehru. That's very conventional. That's true. Yeah, and, yeah, but, yeah. You know, widely publicized for a variety of political and um, cultural reasons. And right. it was very little, you know, I, I think it is a kind of generated hype yeah. for one kind of ideology. Right, right. So right, I right. thought that you know, it's better to focus on others because you know, others were equally illustrious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yes, you see, so. the problem is that even India's own intellectuals are, uh, have not done enough to 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 uh, uh, study the others. Uh, uh, I mean, even an icon like Patel is, gets left out. That's uh, right. How much? That's right. Yeah, you know. And if you talk about Patel and Ambedkar or, or um, uh, Savarkar, then you tend to be a class ah, one particular yeah, yeah, yeah. level. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. In fact, you know, I'm I'm being branded as a fascist. You know, BGPI. You I, fascist, am you know. I am too. So yeah, I am too. So I know. <laughs> so I think you know. I I and Amartya Sen. You know, I mean, the great economist. I yeah. mean, he is after my life and saying all kinds of things <laughs> against me <laughs> simply because he appropriated you know, thirty decimal of Vishwamitra lands. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I I didn't raise it. You know, some of his colleagues raised this matter. <laughs> Yeah. Chancellor. <coughs> Chancellor, Chancellor. Same pillar. Same pillar. Are you ready to me? Nimai? We have more than 100 participants. May we start? Time is over. Uh, Professor Panagaria? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. I'm ready. You know, uh, you know uh, <laughs> in our system, we start with Beth Gan. Okay. That's the system you know, which Tagore started. I mean, it's a university yeah. lecture series, which was, you know, held uh, earlier, but because after some time it was just stopped. So I revived that tradition. So okay. we start with Beth Gun. When we sing Beth Gun, we normally okay. stand up. So, and once that's over, then the formal proceedings will start. Okay. So shall we stand up? Nimai, shuru karo. Please start. Please start. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Suman. Uh, now, let me start the uh, proceedings uh, formally. Uh, Professor Panagaria is with us. And, um, you know, it's a great day for us because we are, I have been trying to get uh, Professor Panagaria, but somehow the other I couldn't get to him. And here I must you know, express my heartfelt gratitude to his mentor and also my mentor, Professor Jagdish Bhagbati of Columbia University. I uh, knew him, so I wrote to him saying that we would like to have Professor Panagaria in our university lecture series. And it was Professor Bhagbati uh, who uh, wrote to Professor Panagaria and then I immediately I got a reply from him. Uh, and um, uh, today, as you know, we see him in front of us and he is willing to give us a lecture. It's nine o'clock in the morning in New York. Yet, you know, he's so busy. He's so committed to all kinds of academic and other activities. Yet, you know, when he uh, got the request from me, he immediately responded positively. And we expect, uh, set the date, 20th of this month. Um, so it's a, it's a great day for us. I think I would say it's a, the, you know, the Muhammad, you know, has come to the mountain. Uh, it should be other way around, but you know, given uh, the uh, economist of Professor Managadia's stature, you know, it's a great, great honor for Bishop Bharati and all of us. And Professor Managadia, this is a very prestigious um, lecture series. It has an old history, but somehow or the other, um, it, uh, it, it didn't continue beyond the point. Once I joined in 2018, so we started this lecture series in 2019, January. And the first lecture was given by a historian from Cambridge, probably you know, I must have read his stuff, uh, Professor Dilip Kumar Chakravarti. So he um, started, uh, he set the ball rolling. And since then you are the 32nd um, uh, uh, person who gave a lecture in this series. We had you know, uh, both uh, right, left um, and center, centrist views. We had uh, Professor Bhikkhu Parekh, uh, we had uh, Lord Meghna Desai, uh, we had Sanjeev Sanyan, so you know, you know, a variety of people you know, uh, who talked about and we have got, we got another American Professor Geraldine Forbes and um, the next we are getting uh, Professor Bob Korodonsky of Jeffs Madison University of Virginia. He will talk about leadership. So you know, we are getting good people and thanks to your cooperation that you agreed to become part of this um, lecture series. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very happy because I had a chance to listen to you 
and I had had access to your literature, but most of our students who are mainly from rural Bengal, they don't have access to your lecture. They don't have even seen you. So I think it will give them a great opportunity to attract up them, the, the legend, the idol uh, of um, their own perception. Because in the economics world, you are considered to be the god in the last world. And especially with regard to Indian economics, I mean, your work is fundamental. And not only that, Niti Aayog, you know, the institution which was built after the um, discontinuity of the planning commission. I mean, you started as vice chairman of Niti Aayog and you um, uh, here steered the organization for little more than two years between 2015 and 2017 and set the ball rolling in so far as the journey of Indian economy is considered. So Professor Panagaria, I mean, I mean, we are really, really grateful, thankful, and we express our heartfelt gratitude to, uh, to you for having accepted our invitation and grace us with your you know, knowledge, wisdom, and I'm sure your uh, care, concern um, uh, for Vishwa Bharati will continue to remain. And in future also, I don't have to approach you through your mentor, but I'll approach you straight away so that you know we'd like to listen to you more and more whenever there is an opportunity whenever it's convenient for you we'd like to have you in our lecture series now this is a kind of welcome address and again i welcome you formally um, now you know i'll uh, hand over the mic to our so, colleague professor amit kumar Bishwas. you know uh, i think nimai that's the format right nimai yes sir yes sir amit, so, professor amit Bishwas will introduce you and then you will start the lecture. And if you have time, or probably would like to have some question answer. Uh, but again, whenever you say that it needs to be stopped, we'll stop. So the time is, you know, you will just guide us uh, as far as time is concerned, because I know you're very uh, busy today, the weekday. So you must have a lot of commitments to fulfill. Um, so that's the format. You know, once he introduces you formally, he will um, give the lecture. And then we'll have question answer um, for some time. And then uh, I'll again express my uh, word of thanks because here we don't use the term vote of thanks. You know, I learned it from our vice president, Venkaya Naidu Sahab. He said, when I, you know, wanted to give vote of thanks, he said, no, it can't be vote of thanks. It should be word of thanks. So I'll finish the, you know, series lecture with a word of thanks to you and the participant. So with this, I request my colleague, uh, Professor Amit Kumar Biswas to introduce uh, professor Panagari, and he's also a professor of economics in Vishwabharati. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, you have set the ball rolling, actually. And so good evening to all our audience tonight, and good morning to Professor Panagoria. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce a person who needs no introduction at all. But still, as part of as per formality, I have to do that. I am thankful to our vice chancellor said that. He gives that burden to me. He thinks myself to be eligible to introduce a giant like Professor Panagaria. So to us, he is one of the most famous economists in the world today, who takes deep interest in understanding and shaping the Indian economy. He is Professor Arvind Panagaria for us tonight, who holds a PhD degree in economics from Princeton University. And at present, he is the prestigious Jagdish Bhagwati Chair Professor of Indian Political Economy at Columbia University and the Director of Neeraj, Deepak and Neeraj Raj, Neera Raj Center on Indian Economic Policies, School of International and Public Affairs, Columbia University in New York City. Undoubtedly, he continues to be a role model uh, who have shaped the thinking of many students, researchers, and teachers like us, especially those like us who are from the field of international trade, development, and growth. If, if I, I can talk of myself, I was enormously benefited from his and Professor Vakbati's writing on international economics right from my PhD days when I was doing something related to trade, tariff, regulations, and welfare. And actually, in recognizing his contribution, the government of India in 2012 honored Professor Panagoria with Padma Bhushan, the third highest civilian honors the country bestows in any field. And 
to our pride. From January 15 to August 2017, he served as the first vice chairman of Niti Aayog and took us away from this age-old five-year plans to the, to the present situation where the economy continues to be quite vibrant after that. So Professor Panagaria is, was also a former chief economist of the Asian Development Bank and was on the faculty of Department of Economics at the University of Maryland at College Park from 1978 till 2003. And also during these years, he also worked with the World Bank, IMF, and UNCTAD in various capacities. And we all know for almost half a century now, he is publishing in topmost journals and has produced, produced some of the best books that shape the domestic and international policies across the world and India in particular. And until recently, Professor Panagoria was an editor of Indian Policy Forum, a journal co-founded by the Brookings Institution, Washington, DC, and the National Council of Applied Economic Research, NCR, New Delhi. He's also the founding editor of Journal of Policy Reforms, which he started with Professor Danny Roderick. And again, come to my personal experience, I am fortunate to have my first important publication with that journal in 2005. He's also currently the associate editor of Economics and Politics and Journal of International Trade and Economic Development Detail. Fortunately, again, I and a few colleagues of mine have published in those journals as well. Now come to the books. He has also written plenty of books and the books have shaped the policies all over the world. And among his famous books, we have India, the Emerging Giant, published in 20, 2008 by Oxford University Press New Year, which was listed as one of the top peak by the Economist magazine and described as the definitive book on Indian economy by none other than CNN and the Time magazine. And again, in 2013, he published another book why Growth Matters, with uh, co-authored by Jagdish Bhagwati, which won the coveted Eclipse Prize for Excellence in Economic Writing and was listed as the best book of the year by the Financial Times. And needless to say that we, especially in the, in the, in the field of trade and development, we all have grown up reading his book with uh, Professor Jagdish Bhagwati and T.N. Srinivasan, Lectures on International Trade, published by MIT Press in 1998. And we all know that his latest book is also a bestseller that talks about India Unlimited Reclaiming the Lost Gori, published just last year. And we all hope that with his, with his leadership, with his inputs, with his policies, and the government of the day will definitely bring back the lost Gori so far as India is concerned. So I do not waste, want to waste time of the audience any further. I am leaving it the virtual stage to Professor Panagaria, who knows the problem, prospects, and the road ahead for the Indian economy inside out. Before I hand it over to Professor Panagaria, since there are many listeners tonight, I would request them, would, you, must have, you might, might, must be having plenty of questions tonight. So, Given Professor Panagaria agrees, please have your questions pointed and related to the topic that he's presenting tonight, post it in the uh, chat box and we'll be answering as much as it is practical. Thank you and it's over to Professor Panagaria. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chancellor Chakravarti, Professor Amit Veswas, professors and students and friends. Um, I am honored uh, to be invited to give this prestigious lecture. Uh, it is uh, uh, truly uh, an honor also uh, to be speaking to uh, the audience at uh, Vishru Bharti. Um, you are uh, lucky to have a, a prolific vice chancellor. Um, uh, it, it's quite uh, uh, breathtaking uh, how widely he has written and continues to write, you know, uh, in India, we have tradition of doing some good work in our early 
life and and then we largely try to live off of that uh, but uh, uh, vice chancellor chakravarti is quite unusual in that respect i think you know that's a very american way they often say that in america we are judged not by what we did during our lifetime but what we did in our last year uh, you know so <laughs> uh, uh, we, we, we that, and, and that approach really keeps us always on toes that you know uh, uh, when uh, the question is what did you do last year uh, what that means is that you have to be you have to remain productive uh, continuously if if we are going to keep your respect in the profession uh, so all right uh, i'll turn to the subject of the day today uh, so uh, professor biswas um, uh, let's say i'll speak maybe 35 to 40 minutes and then we can you know have about 25 30 minutes of uh, uh, q and a yes sir uh, that that yeah? would be perfect that would be perfect yeah. Okay, all right. So I'm going to use a little bit of the uh, of, of the screen share. I want to show a few slides because it will simply make it visually uh, 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 easier to grasp a few things. But also, uh, I, I think you know um, uh, you are all an academic audience, and therefore there is no reason why we have to restrict uh, ourselves to just uh, uh, a speech. Uh, so, so I'm going to begin with this. The subject you already know is uh, that I've chosen is uh, uh, Indian economy, a historical perspective. Uh, and, and I want to really walk you through the entire post-independence uh, history, how the economy did uh, and, and uh, uh, why so, right? So, so uh, a, a good bit of element of history uh, in what, we will, uh, what I'll do today. Uh, let's see. Um, Okay. All right. So the first thing, uh, this this just one slide, which will give you uh, the the full picture of uh, seventy years, nineteen fifty fifty one to two thousand nineteen twenty. You all know that uh, our fiscal year goes from April one to March thirty one, and that is why you know the years that are shown are fifty fifty one, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, what I have done in this, uh, in, in, in this uh, uh, picture uh, is to uh, give you how our per capita income uh, evolved uh, over the 70 year history. Now, uh, what you, what, and, and, and this I have done by indexing the per capita income. So what I've done is to, to say that, let's say the per capita income in 1950-51 was 100. Uh, you can think of it as 100 rupees uh, per week per person. Uh, that's one way to, to think of it. But basically, you know, what I'm doing is uh, uh, indexing it to 100. Uh, uh, this is a series that uh, is, uh, as you say, it says it's real per capita income, meaning that it uh, takes out the inflation. So, so any uh, any increases are real increases uh, in in the living standards. Uh, of the people. Uh, uh, so it's inflation adjusted. Uh, at, there is a series at 2004 5 prices. Uh, so, so that's the measurement. Now, uh, uh, what are the points to note? Uh, uh, I, I think the picture should basically tell you the story of, of, of the country over the 70 years uh, straight away. Uh, that there was a very long period, you know, we, we have had a very long period uh, uh, around here when the per capita income rose at a snail space. I mean, it's almost like, you know, uh, King Kong sat on this graph and flattened it completely. Uh, uh, not, not entirely, but almost, almost entirely, particularly in the first 30 years. Uh, so if you start at 100 in 1950, 51, uh, 30 years later, 30 years later, you've gone to 156, 1980, 81. Very, very, uh, 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 I mean, uh, if you are looking at your incomes at a, at an, on an annual basis, you'll probably not even notice it. Uh, maybe you will notice a little bit if you really looked at uh, two different points in time in 8081 and then 5051. But otherwise, you know, but in our lives, we observe what is happening to us every uh, continuously. And in, in terms of continuous observation, you experience hardly any change. And no, no surprise, this is a period during which poverty did not fall at all. Uh, good rains, you got uh, reduction in poverty, bad rains, drought year, 
uh, a poverty levels which is up. That was the story pretty much as far as poverty was concerned. Now, 1881 to 1991, I call that a transition decade. Uh, uh, and, and we had some acceleration during this period. And, and so whatever we did in the first 30 years, roughly, just a little bit less than that, perhaps, uh, we managed to do uh, in uh, 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 10 years alone. Okay, so what was accomplished in, in, in 30, first 30 years was done in, in, in roughly 10 years. So this is an addition of 56 uh, 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 over 100 in the first 30. And in the next, uh, uh, we were able to, uh, um, uh, in fact, add, add maybe a little bit more, right? Because it's about 61 uh, additions. So rather than 56, we added 61. And so that's in fact a slightly larger increase uh, than in the first 30 years uh, uh, over just a 10 year period. So this is the transition. 91, as you all probably know, was the watershed year uh, uh, in Indian economic history. We switched gears. That is, you know, uh, effectively, uh, even though, you know, formally we gave up planning uh, in uh, much later uh, uh, during. Uh, uh, you know, 2016, 17, somewhere there, uh, this was the, well, or you could say when Niti Aayog replaced the planning commission, uh, but effectively the framework that we had chosen for uh, the first 40 years, finally we decided to drop that in 91. So that was the watershed year. That's the beginning of what we call formally the beginning of our economic reforms. And then you see the next decade, uh, within a decade, you have added about uh, uh, 90 to, 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 to income. So again, more acceleration, uh, but the real big story actually is all in the current millennium. That's where you add from 308 to 851 you go. So you know, you've added 500 plus uh, 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 during this uh, period of about 20 years. Uh, so, so that is really the, what has happened. So those of you who are relatively younger uh, would see that your living standards have changed uh, 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 significantly. Uh, if you talk to my generation and talk my lives the first 30 years or so, hardly any change, uh, very little, very little. Uh, now that's where, now we come back to ask, you know, what went wrong. So this same pattern, of course, also uh, uh, comes out from, hmm, Somehow I can't uh, move my uh, slides here. Is there something you're controlling? Hmm. Um, Professor Biswas or Mr. Sa, can you look up what's happening? Uh, this seems to have frozen. Is it my local problem or? Let's, I'm going to try to stop share and see if, if we can. Screen share across No, no, I'm not share it. Oh, you might have So you just uh, stop the screen share, then you restart the screen share, it will come. Yeah, I'm trying to also get to my cursor is not. Ah, okay. Ah, okay, we got yeah, it. Yeah. All right. So I don't know what happened here, but <laughs> we've got the next slide. Uh, so this really uh, uh, reproduces uh, pretty much in terms of growth rates. What the pattern that I've shown you uh, is reproduced here in terms of the growth rates. And you can take, you can look at it, you know, first uh, uh, 30 years, 51 to 81, uh, GDP grew at 3.7%. In per capita terms, we are going only annually at 1.6%. So, you know, in every year, if uh, you start at 100, you add 1.6, not a perceptible change to a value of 100. Um, and, and so, 81, 92, we grew, do a little better, 5.3% for the GDP growth rate, per capita income 3.2, so we kick it up. 92 to 2003, we kick it up a little further, 5.8 and 3.9. 2003 to 2020, that is the period for us uh, of the fastest uh, rate of growth. 7.4% uh, in GDP and 6.1% real per capita GDP. And this is the period during which a lot of the change happened. This is also the period during which we saw uh, a massive decline in poverty. Uh, and, and these are numbers I can show you and all. Uh, uh, I'll not do that today because we have limited time. 
uh, but uh, uh, poverty really, this is the period during which comes crashing down uh, uh, and, and across the board. You know, sometimes people give the impression that, oh, you know, only uh, certain groups got uh, uh, incomes and, uh, you know, the, the poor got poorer or there was no, big, no trickle down happening to the poor and so forth. That is a bunch of nonsense. If you look at the numbers very clearly, everybody is benefiting as a group. You know, I don't mean every individual is benefiting. Uh, I'm sure you can find cases of individuals, but as a group, if you look at the scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, you can look Hindus, Muslims, you can look at Jains, you can look at Sikhs, because we identify these groups in the sample surveys. Uh, poverty declines across the board. Uh, uh, so so uh, it, it, it was, you know, this, this whole euphemism often or, or, or skepticism that is often expressed that somehow, you know, uh, uh, gro growth helps only the rich or something. It, 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 it's simply not borne out by the data. Uh, 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 it, it is very uh, uh, broad based impact. Uh, and and at this, in, in a very similar sort of way, when we thought that we could change poverty by uh, uh, redistributing, we had zero success, uh, meaning the earlier years, uh, uh, earlier decades. Uh, uh, and, and that was no surprise, you know, because there was not enough to redistribute. There were so many poor people and so few from whom you could redistribute. Uh, and, and even those few didn't have that much of income so that you could redistribute and make everybody uh, 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 less poor or, or bring them up uh, above the poverty line. Uh, so uh, uh, that, uh, let me quickly, I'll skip that and let's uh, uh, return to, to uh, see, this is not letting me stop this share screen. I think you'll have to, ah, okay, good. Okay. All right. Uh, Let's let's get back to now the story that I want to, to, to narrate what happened uh, and particularly I want to focus on uh, uh, the, the earlier period, uh, uh, the, the first three decades, what went wrong. Uh, now, uh, when we started after independence, uh, uh, the, the policy framework was very, was very much shaped by Prime Minister Nehru. And Prime Minister Nehru, uh, having just uh, won the country's independence, uh, very much felt that, you know, India also needed to be economically independent. And independent, not as in the sense of uh, uh, that we are using it today. You know, today we use the word independence in the sense of self-reliance. Uh, 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 Nehru's uh, way of thinking was that uh, uh, what we required was self-sufficiency. Uh, he felt that, you know, uh, uh, if we have to, that we, we ought to produce whatever we need. Um, and uh, uh, what that means was that if we, for example, we needed bicycles, uh, uh, then we ought to also uh, produce the bicycle parts here. It's not merely a matter of assembling the bicycles. Uh, it was also that bicycle, uh, the, uh, the, the parts uh, themselves had to be produced domestically, but then parts have to be uh, must use the steel, so we must also produce the steel. And uh, of course, uh, 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 all these things also require machines. Uh, 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 bicycle parts cannot be produced without machines, so we should also produce machines. And machines take steel as well, and so therefore, you know, more steel. Um, so that was the model that, you know, we wanted the country to be self-sufficient uh, and not be reliant on international trade. Uh, and, uh, 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 and there are a lot of speeches uh, of Prime Minister Nehru from that period that you can look at. Uh, I can give you many references. Uh, uh, so that's not really at issue. Um, now, uh, 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 what did that translate into? Policy-wise, what does that translate into? The, the first thing to recognize is that, look, you know, if you are trying to produce everything uh, under the sun and the economic base is so small, remember that, you know, economic base, I showed you per capita incomes were low, uh, uh, the total GDP was low. Uh, uh, and of course, at that level of income, the savings rate is also very low. 
So when you translate, you got very limited savings. You got therefore very limited capital. Uh, and uh, 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 with that limited capital, if you are going to say that I'm going to produce everything under the sun, you are going to simply uh, 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 spread that capital very thinly across too many activities. Uh, so, you know, the, the commanding heights of the industry, as we used to call, right? We used to, uh, 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 let me see, what is the issue here? No, Professor Panagari, no, no. you can answer those questions yeah, later. Hold, Once you hold, finish hold it, the question, we can yeah. present it that in front of you. Right, right. So, so let's, let's do that later, yeah. Um, okay, uh, so, so when you spread capital thinly, now, what happens? Uh, you've got very limited capital, very scarce capital, and you're spreading it over a large number of activities. You naturally are not going to get the right scale. Now, there, there is also a dichotomy in the sectors. There are products that you have to produce uh, on some limited scale, at least on some scale. Things like uh, automobiles, uh, steel, machinery, they have to have some scale. You cannot produce those products Railways, railway wagons, railway engines, uh, uh, if you want to produce aeroplanes as well. So they have required some minimum scale. Uh, you cannot produce them in cottage industry, right? So what the, what, what, what the decision was made that look, you know, these commanding guys, these large, uh, the, the, these products that require some minimum scale is where we are going to put all our capital. Anything that's light manufacturing, labor intensive apparel, footwear, furniture, uh, um, uh, products of daily use, uh, kitchenware, et cetera, they will go into cottage industry and they will raise their own capital internally in, 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 in the cottage industry framework. Any, for, uh, uh, any formal savings that are available will actually be invested in these uh, uh, products which require some minimum scale. Now see what happens. When you're trying to do that, first of all, uh, as far as your light manufacturers are concerned, uh, they are not going to emerge as export products. They simply cannot because in the cottage industry framework, the scale is not good enough. Uh, uh, and in any case, no cottage industry you know, looks beyond maybe uh, 15 uh, or 20, uh, 20 mile radius uh, of distance, uh, maybe 100 or maybe 200, but certainly not the international market. Uh, so cottage industry, therefore, like manufacturers, we were not going to compete. But even in the in in, in the scale, you know, where uh, 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 capital intensive industries, uh, there also the scale was very low. Uh, you know, for example, the scale of things like automobiles, uh, scooters in India was not good enough to make you competitive in the global markets. So what that immediately meant was that, look, you know, the, in everything, as far as the industrial products were concerned, the quality as well as the cost of production was such that we are not competitive, which means, of course, we can't generate export revenues. And if we can't generate export revenues, then imports are not possible. Uh, uh, and of course, in any case, these products were not competitive. Therefore, if imports were to be permitted, uh, they would fail to compete. And so, you got import licensing put in place uh, uh, and practically everything became subject to import restrictions. Uh, in the early years, 1950s, we had some sterling balances. They, these were uh, 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 pound sterling uh, that the British government had uh, 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 owed India for its participation in the Second World War. So that allowed us to keep the import regime a little bit liberal in the 1950s. But 1958, there was a foreign exchange crisis after which we adopted foreign exchange budgeting and then onwards, imports become highly restricted. So as far as the import regime was concerned, it, uh, everything came to be licensed and consumer goods imports were completely denied. Uh, they became banned. Uh, uh, intermediate inputs, machinery, et cetera, were greatly monitored uh, and whether or not you permitted all depended on what the foreign exchange situation was which was not very good because you know, if you were not competitive in any of your industrial products, uh, uh, the, the ability to generate foreign exchange was uh, uh, almost non-existent. Now, uh, so that's the import side of the policy regime. 
uh, and what I'm trying to describe to you is how uh, uh, the, the choice uh, uh, of um, uh, 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 just just a single decision that you know uh, the, uh, we must produce what we consume or self sufficiency how that drives the policy so the the entire import regime of course uh, uh, was was basically coming from the decision uh, to, to to diversify the economy uh, 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 very rapidly on a very large scale you know large number of products to be produced right now the same policy also actually became the reason for a lot of what we later came to call the license permit raj uh, of which of course import licensing was a part but on industrial investment side also uh, uh, what this required was some form of licensing why because uh, if 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 you leave the allocation of investment funds meaning allocation of savings or capital to the market it will go into activities that are most profitable uh, uh, it will not necessarily result in this kind of diversification and so if you need uh, trying to diversify plus if you are trying to make sure that no capital goes into the the uh, uh, light manufacturers because scarce capital had to be diverted into the highly capital intensive uh, uh, machinery steel kind of sectors or automobiles uh, uh, scooters etc uh, then you needed a mechanism. What was the mechanism? So there were two mechanisms used then. One was public sector uh, uh, manufacturing. So the government directly took the savings through the taxation and they invested in some of the uh, commanding heights of the industry. But even private investment could not be allowed to follow profits, but instead it had to be uh, allocated through investment licenses. So the rule became that you know anything that required a, an investment of more than a million rupees this is not a very large sum, right? You know any enterprise that requires or any project that requires more than a million rupees, uh, uh, you had to get a license. Uh, and of course, if uh, uh, you tried to get a license for light manufacturers, things like uh, textiles or footwear, you are never going to get that. Uh, uh, and later on, of course, we created this small scale industries reservation that was in 1967. So we formally drew up a list of these light manufacturers that these are for the exclusive manufacture by the small enterprises. Small enterprises initially was defined to those with investment uh, ceiling of just 750,000 rupees, uh, less than a million rupees that is. Uh, that was raised by 1980 to 2 million, but 2 million rupees is still not a large investment. Uh, so that was the small scale. For the remaining ones, you have to get a license. Uh, and and uh, so the, the, the entire license permit rights that as, as we call it, really followed or, or came flowed from this desire to diversify the economy and uh, 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 extreme desire not to rely on international trade. Now there's another set of policies that also emanated from the same framework, from the same objective. And uh, 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 that was the uh, uh, price and distribution controls. Now, you know, when you are diversifying in this way, uh, uh, you're giving every product very limited production capacity. So take the example of automobiles. We had just allowed two companies, uh, Fiat and uh, uh, Ambassador, and those also were controlled. The number of units, number of automobiles that could be produced by Ambassador and those by Fiat were limited by the investment license. Uh, and that of course meant that if they were even at, with that very poor quality, given the shortage of automobiles, if you were going to simply sell them uh, in, in the free market, uh, the price will be extremely high. And that of course would mean assured easy profits for those who got the license. Uh, and so therefore, uh, again, this, there was side by side, there was a socialist, socialist way of thinking uh, on this that you know, we can't allow such large profits. Uh, and particularly when they're assured because of the investment license. Uh, and so we said price will be controlled. So price controls were imposed that uh, uh, the ambassador got its price, Fiat got its price, and uh, uh, they couldn't sell the product above that price. Well, when you set the price at below market level, many more people want to buy than there are 
automobiles. And that, of course, then requires some mechanism to distribute these across those who are demanding it, those who want to buy it. And so therefore, permits came into existence that if you wanted cement, if you wanted telephone, if you wanted automobile, if you wanted scooters, you had to get a permit. Who would get the permit? Well, that depended on the set of priorities that the government then decided. So we got the license permit charge uh, complete. Unsurprisingly, the, the, uh, uh, the, the result was extreme inefficiency, very low growth, uh, and those numbers I've shown you, and you know, hardly perceptible increases in per capita incomes. By the second half of the 1970s, this was becoming very clear that the system, that the model that India had adopted was not working. At least there were some enlightened bureaucrats. Uh, at the policy level, there was still not um, a willingness to, to uh, uh, admit that uh, the whole framework was wrong. And therefore, the framework was not going to change that easily. It didn't. But what they tried to do was to work around the existing policy framework and try to liberalize a bit. And that process kind of began in a very piecemeal way in the late 70s, continued through the 1980s. Um, uh, uh, and and, and in, the, in, in the second half of the 1970s also, uh, uh, two or three political economy factors that helped this process uh, uh, getting started. One was simply that you know, the oil crisis led to an increase in demand for Indian workers in the Middle East. That brought in some remittances. And those remittances uh, became available uh, for importing products. And so you got a little bit of headroom to liberalize imports. So that was one factor. But also at this time, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, some industry had come up and uh, uh, those uh, industrialists who had been successful in establishing a few industries uh, started knocking on the door of the various ministries that look, you know, we got this industrial capacity, but we need to bring in raw materials and without raw materials, uh, which are not even available domestically, we can't use up the capacity. So that also put some push uh, uh, from the industrialists to uh, do some liberalization, at least of the inputs and machinery. Uh, so some of this happened, what we did was to start at what is called, you know, a typical Indian approach, uh, uh, open general licensing. Right, so we, uh, the, the, this was uh, the open general licensing simply meant that we created a list on which a number of items that were not domestically produced were placed and said, well, for these uh, items which are not even produced domestically, uh, no import license will be required. So that's how some liberalization happened. In the 80s, uh, the, uh, it, it was also helped by the fact that uh, a lot of our canalized imports, now canalized means uh, government monopoly on imports. So, you know, in around early 1980s, almost 60% of India's imports uh, were coming through canalization. And these are largely, you know, food and oil were two very big, big such imports. Uh, but in the, by, you know, in early 1980s, we became, uh, we became self-sufficient in food. Discovery of oil in Bombay High also helped a little bit in cutting, cutting the imports of oil. So, there was a reduction in canalized imports, which freed up foreign exchange for other imports. So it, that also facilitated. So, and then there was some liberalization on investment licensing also. I won't go into the details. You know, you can read up all the details in my India, the Emerging Giant book. Uh, uh, that's very painstakingly kind of described there. Uh, all of that helped kick up the growth a little bit in the 1980s. And as we approached the second half of the 1980s, uh, one another factor that came to play uh, uh, in, in, in stimulating growth was fiscal expansion. This was uh, the period, you know, the second half of the 1980s when fiscal deficits were very large, uh, went into double digits and all. Uh, and that also fueled demand, which in turn did fuel some industrial growth. So in the last three years of the 1980s, you see a big spurt in growth. The average uh, 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 growth rate during the last three years of the 1980s was about 7%. But that was an unsustainable process <laughs> because, you know, when you run such large fiscal deficits, what also happened was that the government went to borrow outside because the interest rates were very low abroad. So the government thought that, you know, they can borrow cheap abroad. But of course, the 
that abroad has to be also serviced ultimately. And that, of course, began to eat up the foreign exchange earnings. So by 1990, about almost 30% of the foreign exchange earnings, via exports were being absorbed by the, uh, by, by the uh, 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 debt servicing abroad. Uh, and then on the side, as growth had been stimulated in the last three years, particularly the 7% growth in the, uh, in, in, in the last three years of the 1980s, that also pushed the demand for imports further up. But the export earnings were not rising that rapidly. And so at the end of the day, we got the foreign exchange or balance of payments crisis. That was the 91 crisis. Uh, that was also the year during which uh, Rajiv Gandhi was assassinated during uh, the, the election campaign, uh, which paved the way for Narsimha Rao to uh, come to the front. And he, he became the prime minister. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, nobody predicted it, but he turned out to be a very different kind of prime minister than all the others that had preceded him. Uh, 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 there are various explanations for it, but I'll not go into those, but, but mainly at that point he decided that time was ripe to bring about a major change. Uh, small little kind of piecemeal changes that we were doing in the 1980s were simply not good enough. And that's where he unleashed the reforms. A lot of people kind of you know, say that uh, uh, we were pushed by the World Bank and the IMF. It is true that at the very early stage, the very first stage uh, uh, liberalization, because we needed uh, the, the approval of the IMF so that the markets will begin to land India once again. Uh, so that is true that there was involvement and there was uh, uh, approval uh, of the IMF and the World Bank of what we were doing. Uh, uh, but largely the reforms had been internally driven. Some of the things that the fund and bank wanted but India chose not to do labor law reforms. I know actually firsthand that the bank and the fund were very much pushing for labor law reforms at the time. We didn't want it, it didn't happen. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, more importantly, uh, uh, after the first set of reforms in 91, uh, uh, India was back in the driving seat because the economy got stabilized quickly. The fiscal situation improved very uh, significantly. Uh, and uh, 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 India no more needed actually to borrow from the bank and the fund. Uh, quite the contrary, actually, the bank was, uh, the World Bank was keen to loan to India. And in the end, uh, the, the way it loaned was that whatever changes India was making on its own, they, there was no conditionality involved subsequently uh, at all. Uh, it was an internally uh, driven process pretty much. Uh, uh, not pretty much, it was in fact an internally driven process. Uh, uh, and based on that, the bank, World Bank continued to lend to India. Uh, um, uh, so massive liberalization followed, you know, for about five years of Narsimharov, we had a lot of liberalization uh, happen. Uh, you know, licensing, uh, except for the consumer goods was completely withdrawn in the one stroke uh, in, in 91. Uh, but tariffs were also compressed, you know, if you look back, the top tariff rate in India, industrial tariff rate was about 355% in 1991. By the time the Simarav left, I think it had come down to maybe 65%. Uh, it's, it's all documented, so I'm speaking from memory right now, but, uh, but very big compression during that period. Uh, 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 the investment licensing was completely ended at, uh, uh, in one stroke at that time. Uh, the economy got opened up to foreign investment. Uh, 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 you know, uh, systematically. Uh, so a lot happened. Uh, uh, then we had three unstable governments immediately after uh, Narsimha Rao lost the election. Uh, uh, then 98, uh, uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee came, came back and uh, for six years he ruled. Uh, he had to go to election again in 99, but there was still continuity because he came back. And those six years were years of really, really major reforms. And that all again is documented in many of my writings. Uh, you can look up, but uh, 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 that was a process. You know, for the first time, we also had a prime minister at the time, you know, who talked about double digit growth. I mean, and, and Prime Minister Vajpayee, and like, you know, Prime Minister Rao, uh, 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 because of the political constraints he felt he faced at the time, uh, was very mute about reforms, you know. Uh, he, he rarely mentioned in his speeches. Uh, Prime Minister Watchway was different. 
uh, even in his speeches uh, from the Red Fort on 15th of August and so forth, he'll talk about double-digit growth and really put it in the context that you know our poverty is so massive and we need to fight poverty and uh, there is no way to do it without double-digit growth. So he really aspired to that. Uh, and uh, 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 the impact of all those reforms finally began to happen uh, starting in the year 2003-04. That was the year for the first time India grew at 8%. And, and that, I mean, it, it had grown before, but it grew at 8%, which was then maintained for, a, uh, for, for almost a decade. If you take about nine year period from 3-4 to 11-12, uh, India grew on average during that period at 8.2%. That was the period during which the most massive reduction in poverty took place. However, UPA, you know, to its first, to its credit, in the first, I mean, both UPA one and UPA two really did not carry forward the process of reform. So, from and from a, an economist such as mine perspective, uh, that those were lost ten years. But at least in the first term of UPA. They didn't do anything that uh, was uh, anti-growth, largely, you know, no reforms uh, except for one or two things. They did not reverse any of the reforms. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, growth momentum that had been acquired in the last year of the uh, of Vajpayee government continued. And, 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 and they didn't uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, do things that would put, put a stop to that growth process. So we did grow very rapidly during that period, but we did not follow up on the reforms. And that became much worse in UPA too. A lot of anti-growth uh, uh, policy measures, measures got taken during that period, you know, uh, 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 the cross the, uh, the education, you got the, uh, uh, the, even the right to education act, the way it, it, it was, uh, um, uh, the, the way it was uh, uh, framed, uh, the land acquisition act, uh, the food security act, uh, uh, um, then the paralysis in the government, uh, the, the uh, 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 almost complete blockage of the environmental clearances on the infrastructure projects, all that, you know, in, in the last two years of that, uh, of, of the UPA government that showed back, uh, that very quickly kind of reflected itself in uh, a very sharp decline in the growth rate. Uh, and and uh, uh, if, if you follow or if you look back, you know, in the archives of any of the newspapers from economists to uh, our own newspapers, you'll see that, uh, that, that, you know, this was a period during which uh, uh, almost all macroeconomic uh, indicators, the inflation rate, interest rates, uh, uh, were all going haywire and, and the growth rate uh, uh, fell dramatically as well. So 2014, of course, that was the time Prime Minister Modi won the election, came, came and tried to re-stabilize the economy. For the first four years, actually, the economy didn't grow quite well. First five, actually, you can say the average growth was 7.4%. So largely, the growth rate was it didn't get back to the 8.2% level that had been achieved on for nine years from 3, 4 to 11, 12. But uh, it was 7.4%. A lot of people don't recognize this, you know, they, because the perceptions get determined so much by what is happening immediately. We just think that the situation has always been this bad in recent past. Uh, but that's just not the case. Actually, the economy did grow 7.4% uh, in the first five years. Last year, the, the 1920 was, was a bad year. The growth rate fell to 4%. Uh, uh, and that, had, that also actually was the result of what had been inherited by this government. You know, uh, some of the mistakes by this government as well. Uh, 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 but, but the big, big thing that they inherited was all these uh, bad loans that had been advanced, you know, starting in the year 2006 or seven or eight, somewhere there, depending on how you want to count your numbers. But a uh, lot of bad loans were given, which finally became non-performing assets of the banks and uh, led to that breakdown of the credit growth. Now, the mistake of the Modi government, I think, was that, you know, some of this cleanup should have started in 2015, uh, if not 14, actually, you know, I'd been writing it uh, uh, even before the Modi government came uh, to, to office, uh, but uh, uh, for whatever reasons, you know, the, the, the process really did not begin till 2017. Process of cleaning up the non-performing assets did not begin till 2017, by which time the damage had already been actually done. Uh, and that financial sector stress still remains because, you know, and, and that accounted for the decline in my thinking, in the growth rate to 4%, 4.1% in uh, 1920, 
Uh, and then we got hit by the pandemic. Uh, and with that, of course, you all know, uh, the growth rate uh, went into negative territory. Uh, and that's where uh, we currently are. So uh, let me just stop there. Uh, I think, you know, uh, I've exhausted the time I set for myself. Uh, 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 anything else that you have uh, that is bothering you, uh, we can take up in the Q and A. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Panagoria, for his for your fascinating lecture. And there are a few questions already. If you could look at the chat box and you check the question that needs to be answered. <clears throat> yeah. So you, why don't you tell me the questions? Well, uh, the first question by Mr. Kusum uh, Pandey, Kusumkar Pandey, is, is, is how does the model of producing steel, as you refer to, is very different from the model prevalent in the world at that time, whether US, UK, China, USSR, the prevalent models of the time, which country in those early 30 years was following a very different model? Very good question, actually. So the, uh, now I should make it clear that the conventional thinking, including by most of the mainstream economists, including our own, my mentor, Professor Bhagwati and so forth, um, in the 50s, was that what India was following was a reasonable policy uh, and, and planning that we adopted, et cetera, was, was generally accepted, accepted. There were some voices which were uh, descending but broadly there was and the industrialists also the Bombay plan, et cetera, right? Uh, but by early 1960s, there were at least four countries which broke away. One of those was always on that beat, which is Hong Kong, small, you know, city state, uh, uh, which was always, you know, a, a free trading uh, country or entity. It was not a country, it was free trading entity. Uh, but Singapore, Taiwan and South Korea, those four, uh, uh, Taiwan a little ahead of uh, uh, Singapore and South Korea, but uh, in South Korea, a little bit lagger among those three. They broke away from this import substitution model. Now their import substitution model, of course, to begin with was very different. What they, the way, you know, what we said was we want to produce everything. That's not how they were going about import substitution. They were saying that, look, you know, uh, uh, textiles and clothing, uh, these light manufacturers, this is where we ought to do our import substitution. Because we are a labor abundant country, uh, labor is cheap in our country, this we can produce cheaply and be competitive. So that's where they did some import substitution. By late 50s, early 60s, in, uh, import substitution in these products on the final stage of production had been exhausted. Now the question they faced was, you know, should we go further deeper so that you know, we start uh, also import substituting into raw materials and components and all the other uh, uh, you know, intermediate inputs and all or we really exploit our comparative advantage, our cost advantage in these products become export oriented. And these countries basically made the choice that look, you know, we are labor abundant country. Uh, we can outcompete the uh, uh, other countries in these products. And so they became, they, 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 they became export oriented. And, and they, they, so, so they didn't, you know, uh, do any heavy industry stuff. I mean, Korea, the only, only industries that it promoted in the first 10 years, you know, until 1973, uh, 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 more actively were things like fertilizer uh, and some of the petrochemical uh, uh, complex. Uh, these are done for strategic reasons, agriculture and so forth, but the rest of it was really neutral policies. There was no, uh, uh, you know, targeting of industry or any industrial policy. This is a later development of the 70s. Uh, most authors, you know, write in a, in a way that uh, they, they, they miss out that or, or on purpose actually leave that out. This 10 years of period, you know, Korea and Taiwan both actually, where there was no import substitution during, it was a very export oriented model and all, neutral policies across products. Uh, uh, and uh, lo and behold, these countries, you know, uh, all grew about 9-10% a year uh, and uh, massive transformation both in South Korea and Taiwan. Uh, with agricultural workforce moving into industry and services because industry and services could create a lot of good jobs for the low skilled or for the un unskilled at wages that were rising during those days at nine to 10%. Because you know, when you're export oriented, uh, uh, you've got to compete, you have to hack it out in the global marketplace. So you have to work very hard to improve your productivity, improve your efficiency. 
uh, and you also learn from what other competitors in the global economy are doing. Uh, and, and all that allowed them, and then you can also get the scale. You know, the point is that if you are producing only for the domestic market, as we were trying to do almost everything, not only we lack the comparative advantage, you know, we couldn't do things on scale on anything, uh, uh, but uh, uh, you, you also are constrained by the domestic market in terms of market size. And at that time, population wise, we may have been large, but we were not large uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, economic size. And so the domestic market was small. You couldn't get the scale uh, either way. So, uh, uh, but, but by early 70s, things were clear. Data had come out. There was 1970, actually, big study that the OECD sponsored. Uh, Ian Little, uh, you know, of Oxford University had led that project. Jagdish Bhagwati, the, the, the book Bhagwati and Desai, the landmark book Bhagwati and Desai was written in 1970. And a lot of the good thinking, uh, uh, not quite as radical as Professor Bhagwati would be today. I mean, he would be much more radical on reforms today than he was. So, so they were casting themselves still in the, in, in the political context of the day. But a lot of the good thinking is there actually, you know, on liberalization and all. And, you know, if you really seriously think what was the first work uh, on economic reforms, it was 1970 book. But nobody paid any attention to that book. I mean, at the time, at the time. Later, a lot of us studied and, and were really quite surprised that uh, it was uh, so far ahead of its time. Uh, uh, but, but that is really uh, how uh, 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 the, 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 this was different. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, by 1980, the situation is very clear. And even China actually realizes it, <laughs> that they are on the wrong path. And that's a communist country. And they opened up. But we persisted. We took a much longer uh, time and paid for it. And by the way, one thing very important is that the timing here is very, very important. If you get into this early in your country's history, all the subsequent generations, you know, benefit from it. Because Korea started that early, today Korea's per capita income is about $30,000. Uh, 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 and now even if they grow 2%, 3%, what does it matter? And with 2%, they can grow more. Uh, over the, the, the thirty thousand dollars per capita income, then we can at our only uh, with ten percent with our income at only two thousand dollars per capita. I mean, a ten percent increase on two thousand uh, will still be only two hundred. On thirty thousand, even two percent will give you more, give you six hundred dollar increase. So, so the early start is very important, and the more we delay, the more we punish ourselves and our future generations. Right. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, another question, it's quite a popular question. I think I also face it from my students. It says, why can't we scale up our manufacturing now? Our agriculture supports 40% of the working population. Uh, it gives an example of Vietnam that has higher exports uh, on industrial goods than ours. So what's the problem with increasing the manufacturing and expanding the manufacturing nowadays? Yeah, I think that's a million dollar question. That is the million dollar question. Why don't we? And this is what your examples you are giving me here, of course, are the light manufacturers, precisely where we ought to be doing extremely well. Uh, uh, because we are still, you know, 500 million workers, much uh, larger workforce than uh, either Vietnam or Bangladesh. Uh, but it is a fact that, you know, if you go back to 1990, we exported more than both Bangladesh, uh, or, uh, let's say textiles and clothing, particularly apparel. We exported more than both Bangladesh and Vietnam, but today we are far behind both of those. Right. And in the end, it's the policies. At the end of the day, it's the policies. Because uh, uh, in India's labor laws were very restrictive. Uh, that's one. You know, there are other factors as well. I don't want to be just one policy person here. Uh, one has to look at the entire package. Uh, but uh, uh, first of all, the labor laws, well, 1990s anyway, even before labor laws, was the problem of small scale industries reservation. You could not, by law, you were not allowed to scale up. Right. You know, you were required to operate, if you're producing apparel, footwear, furniture, any of these, uh, you know, listed products in SSI list, you are not permitted to scale up. And so that also has a very sociological impact 
of diverting all your successful entrepreneurs into highly capital intensive industries and i'll i'll say something about that in a minute but but that then we did not reform. so finally you know small scale industry reservation was ended somewhere you know well full ending of course happened in 2015 under prime minister modi but largely it was gone by 2005 6 i would say you know uh, some small list was still left out but that was not so relevant but for for clothing footwear etc we had removed that but the labor laws did not change now even now we have changed the labor laws uh, a very substantial reform of labor laws but the central labor laws which is very important is still not quite changed you still have a limit of 300 workers uh, uh, beyond which uh, uh, if you employ 301 or more workers you are not permitted to lay off uh, your workers under any circumstances then well, that still then leaves me hesitant to become to scale up and for a parallel industry 300 is nothing 300 workers is nothing i mean it's it's not like petroleum refining which is all automated and all capital you know you don't need that many workers anyway and the workers that you need are anyway uh, are are, are uh, more highly qualified skilled workers uh, uh, are for, to which the the kind of uh, 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 the industrial disputes act or the equivalent of it now the labor code on industrial relations does not apply right <laughs> but you know where the labor code uh, code uh, does apply uh, you still have the limit of 300 workers so mm-hmm. then you got the land acquisition act which is a huge problem land prices in general i don't mean just the land acquisition act but the land markets in india you try to buy, you try to assemble for the private ent- entrepreneur assembling a piece of land of let's say 100 acres i mean in the end very large scale industry firms require big pieces of land uh, even 50 acres of land if you try to assemble around any city in or around any city it's very difficult for an entrepreneur to do that because the the, the ownership is so uh, diffuse uh, multiple people own different pieces of land which you are trying to assemble and moreover so much of uh, uh, many of these pieces of land are under dispute so you don't even know from whom to buy right now the government can come in and solve the problem if it could acquire the land for the businessman for for the industrialist easily but the land acquisition act of 2013 is so constraining that the, for the government to acquire new land uh, for the industrialist for its public projects also it's difficult but not as difficult it can do it for building roads and uh, dams and what have you but for private entrepreneurs the land acquisition is difficult for the government the law is like written in such way so there are these constraints you know so we have really you know we continue to shoot ourselves in the foot still <laughs> prime minister modi by the way did try to reform the land acquisition act in 2015 but the parties which originally had been complaining these were the opposition parties non bjp parties which were running the states i mean i was at the niti ayog at the time and so you know i know because it, it was the all the chief ministers were brought to the niti ayog uh, governing council meeting to discuss this but it was the the it, it, it was the uh, chief ministers who then decided that no 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 they didn't want to change it because the politics took over the uh, good economics and so the same land acquisition act still remains and that you know i think prime minister modi probably felt very bruised because of that uh, uh, effort because then the law was actually passed by the lok sabha the amendment to the law but uh, it uh, couldn't come through into in rajya sabha right sir. okay so another question by my students uh, he says that what about privatization and this 5 trillion economy that the government plans to have in near future okay so uh, uh, first of all extremely important that privatization proceed uh and that again i started this whole process in 2016 from niti ayog and th- that effort led to the cabinet actually giving the approval for privatization of the first list of public enterprises there was a list that was given approval and while i was still there subsequently several lists were approved uh, 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 uh some of this is in the public domain now you know there are list of about 28 enterprises which had been approved uh, uh, uh and you can find it but uh, uh, in the end the bureaucracy completely uh, uh, blocked that privatization it didn't happen it still hasn't happened and look at you know i mean on air india 
I was, uh, I, I had written the first report before I left the Niti IO. So uh, about the, you know, what should be the process of liberal, uh, of uh, uh, privatizing Air India. And that was not followed actually. Uh, and uh, uh, what has now happened is uh, we are still trying to sell Air India. But it is very, very important, you know, you cannot have such a large public sector, uh, uh, which is highly inefficient and the data are very clear. I mean, you can look at the profit rates, you can look at any measures of efficiency, you know, uh, public sector enterprises perform very poorly. So we need to privatize not only those, we also need to privatize most of the public sector banks. Those also need to be privatized. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, um, so in any case, I mean, the answer is yes, that needs to happen. Uh, will it happen? Uh, we'll, uh, we have to wait and see. I mean, mm. I think the prime minister clearly wants now and now anyway, there's not too much choice because the debt to GDP ratio has risen so much uh, that, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 even in dealing with the pandemic, if you want to maintain your expenditures, uh, if revenues are not coming through, debt will rise yet more. So you need to actually uh, 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 raise revenues by uh, privatizing. Right. Okay, another question comes from a student, Praveen, who asks you, that's, uh, sir, uh, that is also my question. During Nehruvian Nehru days, that was also import substitution and not to go for export promotion. And now Modiji talks about Atma Nirbhar Bharata self-reliant economics. Does he talk about protectionist economics where we do not have to rely more of, on of imports coming from abroad? So this guy is asking, Tom, what about trade policy now with self-reliant India in comparison to Nehruvian India? Economics. Very good. Another, you guys are all brilliant, <laughs> asking all the right questions. Um, yeah. So uh, now, this is my reading. Okay. The Prime Minister talked about self-reliant India in his speech in, I think, what was middle of May 2020. That was the first time he mentioned self-reliant India. Uh, my own interpretation is that Prime Minister was not talking about import substitution there although many have gone on to interpret that that is what he was talking. Okay. Why I think that he was not talking about import substitution is the following. This was an, an address to the nation. And in the context of this pandemic that we were facing in the context of emergency and all, I mean, the health emergency and all, uh, and he was talking to the rural folk as well as the uh, urban and so forth. And, and, and my interpretation is that, you know, he was exhorting the people of India that look, you know, we ought to help ourselves. And that's the sense in which he meant Atmanirbhar Bharat. And he also mentioned, you know, local for local for global. He didn't say that, you know, we, we don't, I mean, Nehru, literally the speech, uh, in, in a speech, he says that, you know, we don't want to uh, depend on our imports on the foreign mark, on, on the foreign suppliers nor do we want to depend on the foreign markets to sell our own extra goods to them. Because whenever they uh, didn't want, they would close their markets and we will be in trouble. That was Nehru's thinking. That's not, you know, Prime Minister is not saying that. Now there is import substitution actually going on currently, much to my own kind of uh, 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 disappointment, uh, 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 near horror, I should say. Uh, 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 that started almost like, you know, by the end of 2017 or, or early 2018. Uh, the talk of Atmanirbhar Bharat is, is, is May 2020. So, so the two things are, are unrelated as they are orthogonal to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and, and there is something of a concern, actually. I mean, this import substitution is not quite of the variety that we actually pursued in, uh, under Prime Minister Nehru. I mean, that was a wholesale kind of, you know, uh, and, and that led to a trade. Actually, even, you know, you hardly see ever imports as a proportion of GDP to decline, especially when economic growth is happening. You know, growth was limited in the 50s, 60s and 70s. But nevertheless, there was some 1.6% per capita income and about 3%, 3 to 4% per GDP growth. Some growth was happening. And yet our import to GDP ratio actually fell at peak, at peak in, 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 in the uh, 1950s, 
imports to GDP ratio was close to 10% at peak. Why 1969-70 that ratio fell to just 4%? 4%, you know, that's at 0%, you become auto, meaning, you know, you're completely closed, 0%, 4%. Uh, so that is a very different kind. Here, what has happened is this, that, uh, that uh, we opened up successfully. And so, you know, exports were very successful. Uh, uh, if you look at, for example, uh, uh, just the merchandise exports uh, from in 2002, they were about 50 billion. By 2012, there were 300 billion, six-fold increase, six-fold. Right. Even incomes did not rise six-fold, you know, and, and exports to GDP ratio therefore went up quite dramatically. Uh, and services ex exports grew even faster. They grew, they grew even faster. Uh, uh, and so what has happened, you know, at peak then around 2014, I think, the import to GDP ratio had touched almost 30, 31%. Then it fell, but now, what is happening is that the policymakers think, and this is where the error happens. This is also the point at, on which, for people, free trade advocates like me, there's a very difficult fight, very uphill fight, because it seems very intuitive that look, you know, there, to, even today, probably our import to GDP ratio is close to 23, 24%, somewhere there, you know, either low, low 20s. Um, you think, why am I importing this? All these, all these mobile phones, this, that, you know, I can make them at home. So I, so the policymaker thinks that, look, you know, if, if I replace the imported uh, uh, mobiles by the domestically produced mobiles, I will add that much GDP to my economy. It right. seems very plausible. What is not easily intuitive, what is not seen by the naked eye, and you need a little bit of expertise there to realize is that what I'm trying to gain on the import side, I'll lose on the export side. Exactly. In, in the end, what happens is that when I give protection and move capital into these sectors, and this also applies to the PLI, you know, which everybody is today are going so uh, uh, gaga about, but it does the same thing. Then what you are doing is that in these sectors, where we are not efficient, because if we were efficient, we would be exporting already. Why are we importing? Simply because our costs are too high of these. So you raise the protection, you subsidize, capital moves into these sectors. Well, it's going to move from somewhere. Not, you know, it's not like uh, you got unlimited capital. And so it is going to come out of the exportable sectors. And so those are the sectors where you are competitive. Right. But private returns have become now higher here because of the subsidy and because of protection. And so the capital goes where the private returns are the highest. Exactly. And the social return was higher there because you know you are, you are more uh, uh, competitive there. So it, it's going the wrong direction. You know, the, the, the damage happens. That's so another thing that Modi government has done. Say, they, have, they have asked Apple to open a manufacturing sector here in Bengaluru so that they can set and set the factory here, they produce from here. This is another way of just not depending upon imports and ship the production here altogether and start building here. That also adds value to our GDP, right, sir? Yeah, but you see, if you are doing this through subsidization and, some, and all, you know, hmm. then no. What you ought to do, I mean, it's a good thing, but why not have good policies in place? Exactly. What you're doing is you're you, you are substituting protection and subsidies for good policies. Exactly. But what you need are good policies so that the firms enterprises will come anyway. Exactly. And mind you, firms like Apple, they will extract these short-term kind of benefits from the government, you know. Mm -hmm. But they will not come here unless they felt that it is a long-term profitable venture. Exactly, exactly. You know, in fact, what happens is that it is the domestic enterprise entrepreneurs who come into these activities to gain this small, uh, 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 short-term, short-term uh, profits. Exactly. Because you say, well, I'll collect some subsidy, there is a tariff and I'll do that. So, so, so you see what has happened is that as a result of this set of policies, if you look at the, uh, uh, the mobile manufacturers, let us say, none of the domestic mobile manufacturers is coming on a scale that it would become an export powerhouse. Exactly. It's none of these, you know, whereas 
Apple is ultimately going to not only use, uh, you know, supply the domestic market, but it is also going to be export oriented. I mean, that's where they, they also ultimately feel that, you know, the, 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 the big money lies. Uh, and, and so they would, if you had good policies, they would come anyway, although all multinationals try to extract concessions from the government when they feel that, yeah, I want to go. Then right. why lose the opportunity? So you negotiate very hard with the government. Exactly. Sir, another question from my colleague, Professor Devashi Shorkar. Even though you didn't, you didn't talk extensively about the agriculture reform law and agriculture per se, but this question is quite pertinent that uh, the Modi government talked about doubling farmers' income by 2022. Is it going to be satisfied? What do you think on that? There are floodgates of questions. I don't know how long you will be available to us. So we can short it up if you want. want. So okay. let's 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 do ten more minutes. So okay, ten forty. Let's do twelve more minutes. You know, so ten forty. Okay, that's we can do. So that's the question. If you can answer this, yeah. so that's, make the, uh, yeah. that's another very very important question. Actually, very important question because in the end, by the way, uh, in the end, uh, what you need to do is, and somebody had originally pointed out that you know forty percent, forty two percent of India's workforce is still in agriculture. Uh, and, and just look at what is happening in there. Uh, half of India's uh, farm, farm holdings, land holdings, are less than half hectare. Average size of these, you know, so every one of these, half of these holdings, 48%, is, is less than half hectare. And the average size of that holding is 0.23 hectare. It is that tiny. Who can make a living on, on that? And, and the value added and therefore the income from these holdings is so low that even if you double it, it doesn't go far. Uh, uh, you know, with, 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 with a quarter hectare size uh, uh, holding on average, which is, as I said, 48% half of the, the, the holdings, um, it's not even poverty line level of income. It's probably, you know, 60% of that or something like that. So you're not going to get, even if you double the farmer income on, on those holdings, it, it doesn't deliver enough. Uh, and, and it's not that easy to double the farmer income. Uh, 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 so that's the first point. Second point really is that, look, you know, in the end, transformation of the economy, modernization, urbanization, it is all about moving your workforce out of agriculture into industry and services. I mean, South Korea, I gave you the example. Uh, in 1965, about 65% of its workforce was in agriculture. By 1990, it was less than 20% in agriculture. That's what you have to do. And that's where we have been extremely, extremely slow. That's one problem. And so what that amounts to, of course, is that you have to create good jobs for these people in industry and services. So that... You know, because otherwise, I mean, it's not like uh, farmers themselves don't want to move out of there. They badly want to move out of there because the existence is so difficult for a, uh, for these uh, very tiny farmers. Uh, and I have no doubt they are doing other things to generate some more income because you know, no no family of four or five can live on a holding of uh, a quarter hectare. Uh, but but those are also marginal activities. So so they are not you know so they dearly want to get uh, move to industry and services, but. That's where we have not created good jobs. Now, not only our farms are littered with these tiny little holdings. I mean, we are a nation. We are a nation of tiny economic units all around. Look at anything, you know, you'll find that, you know, the, our units tend to be tiny. We don't do scale. Now, industry and services, if you look at it, only 10% of the aggregate workforce Okay, 10% of the whole, whole 500 million workforce, which is maybe 50 million or so, is in enterprises which employ 20 or more workers. That is how dire this is. And, and 20 workers, the enterprise itself is not uh, uh, such a large size. So 50 million workers are working in enterprises that are 20, which, which employ 20 or more workers. That's all. So you've got 50% left, 42% uh, 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 in, in agriculture. 
So that's about 52%. Remaining 48% are basically in enterprises that have less than 19 workers. So most of these enterprises themselves don't, you know, a lot of it is self-employment. A lot of it is self-employment. So they, they're, anyway, they don't generate such large incomes. Uh, 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 and, and that is the problem. And, and so if you remember, I'd mentioned about this whole, you know, earlier, uh, 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 that, uh, you know, our entrepreneurs really was told that you can't be into these apparel uh, and, and footwear like manufacturers. Right? They, so they all went into capital intensive industries. Uh, 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 so today, over this period of 50 years, when we force them to do only these very highly capital intensive or skilled labor intensive industries, their minds and brains have gotten hardwired to do only that. You go to the CII, and ask in any audience, how many of you produce apparel or how many of you produce footwear, how many of you, any of the light manufacturers, not one hand will go up. And one time I sort of asked them, you know, who is India's largest uh, 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 apparel exporter? Nobody knew. I mean, I did because I, th that's, that's what I write on and also I'd spoken, I, I, know, I know, you know, this is Shahi Exports. Uh, uh, and uh, Ahuja is, 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 is the owner of that. Uh, and, and, uh, 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 but, but today, they want to do automobiles, they want to do steel, they want to do software industry, they want to do pharmaceuticals, they want to do uh, 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 banking, finance, this, that. But none of our big entrepreneurs want to do shoes or uh, uh, stitching clothes or something, you know, that's beneath them. And, and so that has been the, the, the fallout uh, of that kind of mindset that we developed of the entrepreneurs also. So it's a bit of more sociological explanation for why we still remain, you know. But, but the, this tiny size of units is the biggest problem, you know. Even in bank, look, you know, you got one large bank, State Bank of India, and after that, uh, all small. I mean, SDFC has in market capitalization is a lot bigger now, but uh, that's, that's because it's profitable. But in terms of operations and so forth, you know, none of our banks, I mean, look at the Chinese, uh, four or five of the biggest Chinese banks are bigger than even State Bank of India, all of them. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, before I, I hand over the uh, forum to my Vice Chancellor, Professor Bidhu Chakraborty, let me ask you the final question. I have a kind of query to you that we have understood the problems that we are facing right now uh, as per COVID situation, the problem with reforms, et cetera, et cetera. Now that you have said in many interviews that modern India started with 1991 reforms. And uh, can we, can we experience, do, do we expect to have another kind of such big reforms coming in our way? Because if we target to have a 5 trillion economy as some questions have asked, so what our, where, where do we lie in our road? What is the roadmap for us to move ahead from this situation? Pandemic is might, there, might be here for this year as well, even though the World Bank is quite bullish about uh, uh, two digit growth for India. So where do we go from here? How do we move from here? Another very good question. And I'm glad actually you're ending with this because now we can talk more optimism <laughs> for the country. Right. <laughs> so, uh, I must say that a lot of reforms that uh, one was asking for have been done uh, in, uh, by Prime Minister Modi, uh, uh, labor, uh, some more, you know, but even there what the, uh, uh, the uh, labor code on industrial relation does is it gives the power to the states. It explicitly says that, and the states don't have to pass any law, they can simply through notification raise this limit from 300 to whatever they want. So that's one thing some of the states have to now come forward. They've been empowered. They should come forward. They should raise, you know, and we don't need all 28 states to do it. If three or four would do it, that's good enough because no enterprise wants to locate in all 28 states. They are looking to locate in two states, three states. You know, so if we can get Gujarat, UP, some, you know, three, four states to do it, that will be fantastic. So that's one thing. Land Acquisition Act needs to be, uh, uh, so in terms of what has been done, so that labor law reforms I mentioned, then also the farm laws are very important because, ev uh, because ultimately people have to move out of agriculture and some productivity and you know, what these reforms will do is begin to connect uh, even agriculture better to the industry. 
because you know they can do this contract farming and also it will it will begin to do that transition that is required that is very essential also so farm laws have been done also on education i have mentioned you know the reforms that i myself had pushed and finally happened the medical education has been done higher education needs to be still done, is still pending but i think it's on the government's agenda so that will happen uh so quite a few things that were necessary have uh, and i've been writing for almost many years uh, have happened uh, there are some which haven't but now in terms of what next privatization is extremely important that needs to happen uh, uh the banks need to be privatized uh, uh, uh and, and, and the the um on trade they need to reverse that is very wrong uh, uh, policy what we are doing right now that 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 would hurt us so we need to return to the liberal trade policies uh, that is uh, very important some things the states need to do with respect to the land laws because land in urban india is extremely expensive now when migration happens migrant needs a place to stay and we pay zero attention to to low rental housing you know housing which would be something like a dormitory hostel like of housing that needs to be proliferated at least in some of the cities where the migrants are coming migrants want to come where the businesses want to locate because if you don't do that then the slums get created and that creates its own problem for the city so so we need to uh, and, and and commercial rental housing is not coming up because land is so bloody expensive uh, one of the simplest thing that the states can do is you know change the conversion laws that for any of the cities when on the periphery see most of the industry comes and locates itself on the periphery of the industry a uh, periphery of the city existing city allow that con rapid conversion of that land and let and convert it for the farmer so that when farmer sells it farmer can capture the price so politically then that becomes a lot easier you know that's a voluntary transaction then that the farmer having realized that now this land is much more valuable because it can be it doesn't have to remain agricultural land uh, can procure get that price but one needs to do that conversion you know to so land becomes needs to become cheaper there are a lot of land that the government owns you know the ministry uh, uh, defense ministry owns an uh, enormous amount of land a uh, 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 lot of the factories that the government has you know Uh, in the old days, sixties and seventies, you know, states will give you a thousand acres, two thousand acres of land to start these public sector units, but they, but they were using only twenty acres, thirty acres, forty acres of that land. Units were not that large anyway. So that whatever is excess land which is not being used uh, or has been encroached upon uh, should be hived off from those enterprises and put it put on the market. A lot of the land is tied up in this uh, uh, urban land ceilings act lit litigation. that also should be you know some compromise should be reached by the government and, and land freed up we need to go vertically up we are the only nation you know who refused to uh, i mean we have uh, you know the uh, new york city would never be new york city uh, uh, without very high uh, tall buildings and particularly in the central business district we do the opposite we allow some more taller buildings on the periphery of the city but not in the center of the city but is the center of the city where you need uh, tall buildings so that you have a lot more space offices can be built uh, and, and all uh, so 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 these are the kinds of things and a lot of the things actually states will need to do now and that's becoming a bit of a constraint because states are not so and and also our own people who write about these things who the journalists etc every little uh, 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 thing that goes around the blame is put on the doorstep of the central government whether it's a matter of central government's uh, uh, jurisdiction or not uh, 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 and, and and so and nobody goes and tells the states that this is something for you guys to do right. so 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 but but some of the things states have to do you know so and look i mean uh, clearly this agricultural marketing was the subject of the state and it's out of exasperation that modi government said that well you know how long can the farmer how long does the poor farmer have to suffer on account of states refusing to do the reform for 20 years the central government every central government upa uh, uh, vajpay government modi government they all tried to do these reforms get the states to do these reforms for 20 years it didn't happen 
So finally, Modi government said, "Look, you know, I mean, uh, how long does the farmer, has, poor farmer, has to be punished?" So they used the some constitutional power uh, 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 that the center had to bring these farm laws. Now, yeah. you know, most of the press, oh, you know, the center is being heavy-handed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is for the central government. Really, it, it ends up getting all the blame, right. and hardly ever uh, any. And, and by the way, anything that goes wrong. Central government has to do it. If there is a ditch in front of your house, you know you think that the central government should come in and uh, uh, fill that uh, ditch. I mean, there is also some citizen responsibility, right? I mean, and this particularly with this epidemic, for instance, none of the citizens has done their job, which was to wear the masks. <laughs> it is the minimum thing they had to do. Nobody did that. But do you see any writer, any writer, commentator, journalist saying that this was the the, uh, the, uh, the responsibility of the citizen? Right. No, it was the responsibility of the Modi government. Modi government is going to put the mask on somebody else, <laughs> somebody's face. I, I think this is where I, I feel that you know right. uh, uh, there is a lot of asymmetry and and politically, uh, 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 the the whole. So the, uh, ultimately, the press is playing also a very negative role. I should say. Right. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Now I hand it over to our Professor Bidhu Chakraborty. Uh, professor Panagaria, you know, I have uh, two, rule, two roles to discharge. One, of course, as the chairperson of these uh, proceedings, I have to extend the word of thanks. But at another level, I am quite tempted to ask some questions to satisfy my curiosity. I know I, you're running out of time. So if you kindly agree, to yeah, listen yeah. to my question, they may, the questions may be very naive because I am not an economist, I am a political science uh, student and also a student of history. I think, you know, I begin with the, the with your last comment. You said, yes, you know, citizens somehow or the other, you know, they always assert their rights, yeah. but they don't simply forget the rights are, you know, linked with the duties as well. Yes. You know, yes. I, I am facing the same problem in fact, my colleagues for listening to me, they will appreciate that I'm facing the same problem here. We're interested in getting seven CPC pay, pay, pay the salary. Mm, right, but when right. it comes to taking even classes, you know, yeah, I have to force yeah. them. And yes. if I you know, do the chalkidari, you know, they start writing letters to the prime minister, to the president, you know, condemning yeah. me, I'm very worse kind of vice chancellor. But anyway, I'm not yes. blaming everybody, but yeah. some of us, you know, are yep. doing that, have been doing that. So I think I fully agree with you that as a nation, we somehow or the other very conscious of our rights, yep. but we forget conveniently that the rights come along with duties as well. Absolutely. Now my question, you know, I have got um, a kind of queries, two in the form of counterfactual questions. One, a real question, which comes out of my kind of concern. The first counterfactual question is the first one, I mean, you you uh, rightly suggested that India's economic growth is abysmal, you know, till 1980, and you know, uh, I, I think it has been established quite firmly that it is largely due to Nehruvian uh, policy of socialistic pattern of society. Right. Now, my counterfactual question is that, like, had Nehru accepted either of the modes, either socialist pattern of society or liberal pattern of society? you know, representing Soviet Russia and America, respectively, probably India would not have had this kind of, you know, abysmal economic rate growth. That's one counterfactual question. How will you respond? And in way you talk about it in your book, which you wrote with President Jagdish Bhagwati. Right. And there you refer to this, uh, my article, you know, Nehru's yes. you know, approach to planning. So that's right. why this question came to my mind. And right. the second question, you know, you talked about uh, 1990 as a watershed in so far as India's um, economic growth is concerned. And so you seem to be suggesting that neoliberal economic path is a way to progress. Now, my counterfactual question is, had Soviet Russia not collapsed in 1989, had uh, there not been an alternative to the um, uh, liberal economic um, thought probably India would have, you know, continued with this kind of, you know, path which we have been following. So how do you respond to this um, question? This is like, again, counterfactual kind of assessment. And the question which I have in mind, I mean, I fully agree that you, you are for privatization. You talked about Air India. 
In fact, my wife is working with Air India. Uh, we keep on fighting because uh, she is uh, going to you know, lose a lot of uh, you know, kind of benefits if it is stay, uh, purchased by Spice J. And there's a possibility. But if it is purchased by Air India, they are very happy. But so you are for privatization. I, so am I. But the question which comes to my mind, now if you privatize everything in India, will that be beneficial to India that is still one third of our population below the poverty line? Now, you know, you, you, for instance, railway, if you privatize railway, which is like the cheapest mode of transport, which even poor people can afford to move from one place to another with minimum price. So if you privatize railway, like American Amtrak, then probably people you know, will lose a kind of an opportunity to move from one place to another uh, at, by paying uh, less price. So, uh, so in that case, do you think privatization per se is a panacea? for India's uh, poverty? I mean, that's the question which I'm asking, given the fact that you are one of the initiator of this policy when you were the vice chairman of the Niti Ayo. And the last question, you know, as an academician, as an educationist, as vice chancellor, and you also have been in the academia for so many years. Now, why do we not have enough Arbin Panagaria in India? Because Arbin Panagaria was the product of Rajasthan University. So our education system had the capability, had the potential to have a Professor Anubhind Panagaria, who is a globally reputed economist. But nowadays, some of the other, we don't have that kind of you know, bright, uh, vibrant mind being produced in India. So is there any kind of you know, medicine or any kind of medicinal prescription you would like to put forward to us uh, educationists in India? That's all. And then I'll you know, form, formally end the proceedings by giving you a word of thanks. So if you kindly respond to this question, if your time permits, I'll be yes. very happy. Yes, of course. So thank you, Vice Chancellor. All fantastic questions, absolutely fantastic questions. Um, uh, on the counterfactual on Nehru. Um, see, I mean, I'm willing to kind of accept that, you know, at the time of Nehru, uh, probably politics, economics, everything, you know, generally, was such that maybe you know what he did was fine, and and actually, if you look at it, Nehru, and this is comes through in my writings, that Nehru was not so uh, uh, he was pragmatic, he was pragmatic. So uh, the, 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 even on foreign investment, he was a lot more liberal than what happened after Mrs. Indira Gandhi came. The real damage to the economy happened under Mrs. Indira Gandhi. Truly, I mean, and in fact, if you divide this thirty-year period into two halves. Nehru, pre-Nehru and post-Nehru, uh, then the economy did do a little better uh, uh, during the pre-Nehru, you know, during the Nehruvian period. Uh, uh, he, he, he was willing, you know, to tolerate and also on, for example, uh, he, in, in, in increasing the share of the public sector into the economy, Nehru was always of the view that let's not do it through nationalization. We will just over time gradually kind of uh, uh, in, in, increase public sector investment, and that's how the ownership will shift a little, little by little to the public sector. So he was very uh, uh, cognizant of the fact that private sector has an important role to play. It was under Mrs. Gandhi that things go haywire. Now, the, that period, so I would still take it fine, you know, if you give me up to 1964-65, I'm okay with that. But then by 1970, the evidence is very clear that, look, you know, our system is, our model is not working and the South Korean and Taiwanese models are working very well. And the studies have come out which show very clearly that, that uh, uh, they, they, they are doing a lot better. Uh, and, and as exemplified also in Professor Bhagwati's writings, uh, it's the, the, the famous book from 1970. We didn't do that. Uh, had you know been the leadership at that point very different. Now there was no chance, snowball's chance in hell actually that any of their liberal, liberal uh, ideas would have been accepted, given the fact that Mrs. Gandhi was the prime minister and uh, who her, her principal secretary was. I mean, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name, but you know these are all very committed Marxist people. Uh, so there was no hope. I mean, you know, <laughs> in terms even, of even P. P. N. Huxer. Huxa, right. Yeah, yeah, Huxa, yes. yeah, yeah. These are committed Marxists, heavily committed Marxists. So, and this is where you see damage is double because she moved much more in that direction. All kinds of nationalizations happened. 
this industrial disputes act was amended this whole restriction on 100 workers uh, which became which has now been turned into 300 uh, uh, for the enterprises small scale industries the reservation you name it you know all uh, oil industry was nationalized and most of the oil firms were nationalized uh, coal uh, mines were completely nationalized uh, 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 all big banks were nationalized insurance was fully nationalized so all that you know so we were going the wrong direction when the evidence was clear that we should be go going the up in, the in the opposite direction and had we done that of course the per capita incomes would have started rising at that time and today we would be much richer the 30 percent poor that you are talking about would be gone i mean by 1990 poverty was uh, abject poverty as we think you know the uh, india's kind of poverty was gone from Soviet Union, I mean, from uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, you know, there were no more, you know. And by the way, they didn't run any Naregas or any uh, uh, of these uh, 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 redistribution programs. Growth was enough. I mean, in those cases, if you look at Korea, Taiwan, none of them are running these uh, 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 social programs at the time. It's a growth which simply was sufficient, it, you know. So that's my first one. Now, Soviet Union, China, I mean, politically, uh, I mean, in the political economy, the breakdown of the Soviet Union and rise of China were two incredibly important uh, events uh, uh, which uh, helped India's liberalization. Uh, because you see, uh, in the 70s, 80s, if you talk to the policymakers, particularly our bureaucrats, you know, you look, you know, uh, 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 Singapore, look at Hong Kong, say, oh, yeah, they don't matter, they're city states, we don't, you know. Then you say, well, South Korea, you know, ah, but there's a small country and they are uniform, you know, they, we are very diverse country, we are much larger country, that doesn't apply to us, is that, you know, and all. But when China, which is a communist country uh, and larger than us in population, adopts liberal policies in the entire decade of 1980s grows at 10%, uh, then you have no defense left. And, and, and of course, the simultaneous Soviet Union uh, uh, breaks down. So those two events were very critical indeed uh, 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 in, in terms of changing the thinking. And of course, you know, we should not forget the coming of uh, Prime Minister Narasim Rao. I mean, you can imagine had, uh, had Mrs. Sonia Gandhi decided, made the decision that she made later in 1998 to return to politics or 96, 96 or 98. 96, yeah. You know, if she had decided at that time that I will take over the prime ministership or put in a prime minister of, of who would follow my instructions, none of these reforms would have happened in 91 either. I don't think they would have happened. We would have gotten over the crisis, stabilized the economy, and then we would have gone back to our business as usual. This process of liberalization would not have continued. So alongside bad luck, we also had some good luck in terms of having Narasimha Rao. And then after two years or three years break, we got Prime Minister Vajpayee. Excellent, you know. The biggest misfortune was the loss of that election by uh, uh, Vajpayee in 2004, because they were on the roll to reform. One more term and, you know, then UPA could have ruled for 15 years. I don't care, you know, things would, would have settled by then and we would have been growing steadily at 8 9% at that time. But that kind of, you know, 10 years loss was, was, was a big one. Now, when you say neoliberal, of course, you know, none of us, all we are saying, and as I think Professor Bhagwati would tell you, uh, is that uh, this is all fine to, you know, use the term neoliberal and all. And, uh, but none of us are saying that, you know, you go uh, to, to where Margaret Thatcher went. We are so far to the left. We were certainly so far to the left. We were just pushing to try to bring you to the bring the economy to the center. At least let's get to the center. And even now, I think you know we are much closer to the center than than we were in '91. But it's still, you know. Uh, so when we say privatization, we are talking of activities that the private that are purely profit seeking. That's purely uh, 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 for profit activities, manufacturing or services like Air India, uh, civil aviation, et cetera. But uh, there is no public purpose served by these activities. So my criterion for privatization is simply that anything that has no public purpose mm. should be left to the private entrepreneurs. 
and 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 none of these you know PSUs that we are talking about uh, saying privatize these has any public purpose. Uh, anything that has a public purpose, railways have a public purpose. So there is no issue. Railways will you know none of us ask about you know uh, in some form how you should do it is a little different. Uh, uh, you know I mean I think we should experiment with private trains. The government can still be the owner and regulator of the railways uh, and, and uh, uh, on the track, for example. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I wouldn't be averse to, to, to running private trains where, where private trains can be run. But of course, large part of the railways will always remain public because there is a public purpose there that you want to bring the service to the masses. Uh, same way, health. Of course, the government will, you know, in what form it should intervene is different, but uh, is something we can argue about. But health, education, it has to remain involved. But it, but the, what is the nature of involvement is, 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 is something I do question. I mean, education, for example, school education. I think the government has done an abysmal job of, of school education. I mean, if you look at public sector schooling, it is, it is such a, I mean, if I may really say so, uh, in, in some ways, the school teacher salaries in the public sector are close to the largest direct benefit transfer system. So little value is generated and such a large transfer, I mean, such a large amount of salary. We are not getting the value. I mean, give uh, give the 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 this the, the the what you are spending for a student thirty to forty thousand rupees is what roughly people mention often in the public sector. Give that to the student parents of the student and let them decide if public sector can provide good schools. Then that money will come back to you. So I'm saying give a voucher to the you know uh, 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 to the parents. And they decide if public sector provides good schools, they'll come to, you know, if uh, like Arvind Kejriwal says that I'm providing good schools, the voucher will come back to Arvind Kejriwal. But, you know, so, so the form, but of course, because access is important in terms of uh, uh, financing of, of, uh, of school education, undoubtedly the state is going to have to uh, play a very important role. Uh, and remember that, you know, there is so much to do for the government today. There's so much to do for the government. And it's not able to do because its finances are all unnecessarily. I mean, look at the public distribution system. Is that really something we need? Give the transfers. And then also if, if, if the public shops can actually deliver better service, the, the buyer will then go to the public shops to buy the food grain. But if they can't, you know, then too bad. But uh, right now, the way the, it's not for the government to run such a large uh, distribution system. You can have a small distribution system where you know they're hard to reach areas where uh, the, the the government goes and actually delivers the food. But this massive kind of uh, in which Food Corporation of India is running one to one and a half percent of the GDP in the fiscal deficit and therefore adding to the debt every year is 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 is. I mean, it's highly inefficient. The, the, the employees pay, being paid such large salaries, almost 200,000 employees in the Food Corporation of India. What is the value I'm getting? It's a very large, amount. I mean, and you know, the thing is that government is not growing money. Government is taking out of somebody else's pocket. I mean, people think that, you know, they, they, oh, it's Sarkari money, so it's perfectly okay. It's not Sarkari money. Sarkar takes it out of your pocket, out of my pocket, and then is trying to put it into somebody else's pocket. Of course, the bureaucrats love to do that, but but uh, 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 in the end, somebody is, is is generating that wealth, which which is then being uh, transferred in a very highly inefficient way. Uh, so so it's not an issue of you know that oh the, uh, you're trying to take the gun, privatize everything. That's not it. I mean, the active wherever the there is a public interest that the government will have to be there. And look at the kinds of things that the government should have been doing and is not doing in public health. The, look at the drainage systems in our uh, cities. 
Look at the electricity supply in the cities. Look at the sewage systems in the cities. Look at the uh, 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 handling of the garbage in the city. That is what the government needs to do and do effectively. But they all want to run the companies and factories like everybody else, but not do what is actually required. Housing is uh, incredibly important, you know. So, I mean, and, and particularly these services they, uh, uh, they, 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 that are essential, you know, sewage, electricity, water, and all. I mean, why should the central government have to do the water also, you know? But that's a center state issue. But that's what it is, you know, that there is so much that the government needs to do and do effectively, which it is not able to do because, uh, partly because at least, you know, it's doing all these other things. Now to your last question, of course, India has brilliant people. <laughs> There's no shortage of incredibly bright people in, in India. Uh, in my field, unfortunately, uh, it's, there is a bit, lot of hysteresis that, that remains. Uh, and you are absolutely right that in my field, certainly there are no economists who are passionately advocating for markets, quite the contrary. Uh, and that's, I think, you know, the nature partly of the profession itself too. But in India in particular, um, I mean, there was a dynamics to it. I sometimes say, I mean, I don't know how true it is. It's a hypothesis that uh, 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 at least at one point, I mean, it's probably no longer true. Delhi School of Economics, we thought was more, more or less kind of, you know, was teaching market economics and JNU was the other. And the brightest of the students came to Delhi School of Economics. And they then got offers from all over in the, uh, in the United States and UK. So they will just be gone there. Colleges, who was teaching at the colleges? Those were the JNU graduates who were teaching in the colleges. So the teaching all, all remained the socialist teaching, which is what, what you know, uh, uh, the, these people are learning at the JNU. And, and so the only outpost that at least at one point was there of, of somewhat you know, pro-market kind of economics uh, with the Delhi school, uh, their graduates were simply not you know, doing the teaching much of it. So we kept reproducing the, the socialist uh, adv advocates of socialism and that remains, you know. I think at the same time to be optimistic, things have changed. Uh, 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 people like me are not as isolated at least, you know. Uh, they, uh, and certainly, you know, there, there is some acceptance. In fact, to some degree, I find policymakers tend to be much more enlightened in this respect. They are willing to listen to us. But also, I think in terms of advocacy, people who don't do a good job, you know, it, a lot of, lot of my colleagues here, even the brightest of the economists, I mean, I used to see this when some of these foreign economists would come in to talk and, and in groups, you know, talk, speak to the prime minister. And you know, I used to sit because of my Niti Aayog position. And the language they talk into, you know, they are on a different planet. You, you have to be able to communicate your ideas in a way that the policymaker would understand. And, and that is a problem. I mean, that skill, that skill is, is, is a special skill, you know. So you understand my difficulty. <laughs> Anyway, uh, thank you, Professor Panagaria. Now let me have the you know, uh, let me perform the pleasant kind of role of uh, thanking you formally. Uh, but uh, before I thank you formally, I remember Professor Bhagwati um, to kindly express our heartfelt gratitude to him. Yes. Kindly remember me to him uh, because because of his intervention, we got you, uh, <laughs> and we are really benefited and enlightened by your very thought-provoking lecture. And our students, colleagues, you know, are extremely benefited because they don't have access to um, the knowledge which you have produced so far. So we are thankful and namaskar to you uh, for your wonderful presentation. And I am thankful to the participants because um, they, despite uh, the fact that our university is closed because of the you know uh, the increasing number of COVID-19 cases. So we are you know, we are now closed for the time being for a week, and we'll review the situation on 26th of April. So despite that, our many colleagues have joined and they are quite happy. And I also um, thank uh, Amit. As I said, Amit is one of the you know brilliant 
the economists uh, in the campus and he really did a wonderful job um, yes. I, I mean you also agree with me so i think yes. Um, yes. Uh, i we should thank him yes. for having you know, moderated the discussion in a very efficient and very you know happy way yes and um, i thank um, the library staff because it's the librarian uh, dr nimai shaha who is the kind of brain behind it he is the one who uh, was in contact with you yes. three years so you know i fixed the uh, speaker and then i talked to him then i leave it with nimai to do the yes. kind of coordination so we to uh, express our gratitude to dr nimai shaha librarian uh, and last with a kind of honest request to you so i know it is very difficult for you to come to india so whenever you come to india next it is my honest request on behalf of all my colleagues of vishwabharati to be present here physically along with your family and uh, you know uh, uh, needless to say you will be our guest our esteem honored guest so whenever you get a chance i mean invitation is open so whenever you have time and uh, come to india your first visit should be vishwabharati i mean <laughs> so that's my request to you with this request professor panagaria stay safe maintain physical distance but not social distance because i think those who are affected they need to be socially connected but obviously we will have to maintain physical distance i mean i disagree with that conceptualization uh, of social distance good point good uh, point but i always maintain that social distance because you know if you get disconnected with those yeah. who are affected they are mentally very you know right. low so i think in order to you know enhance their mental stability mental strength we need right. to be connected i mean yeah obviously you can't be physically connected but obviously on phone on uh, there are many uh, more you know kind of modes of communication thanks to technological growth so i think we need to be physically separate yes but um, no no social distance right uh, very so good point my request to you the same thing and again um, uh, i would like to have you again at your convenience so uh, kindly you know never ever let us down so whenever you get an email from us and i will fix the date according to your convenience because you are so busy and please have your kind of you know interaction and have your faith in in vishwabharati academy and uh, as i said let me finish by the statement that we are really really grateful to you professor panagaria and you are a kind of beacon of light for us because you know we have been listening reading your stuff the emerging giant book is one of my favorite books thank you but you know for the first time in my life i listened to you face to face though virtually uh, but at least you know i got to hear your voice i got to hear how passionate you are <laughs> about the point of view which you hold so thank you very much and god bless all the academia and those who are really contributing immensely to the development of india as an emerging giant thank you well thanks to you i think you know you you brought us all together so it's ultimately all of us have to thank you thank you very much so you might the meeting is over yeah uh, sir before to the wrap up let me just take permission from panagaria sir uh, so what we actually do is that usually we just uh, upload this uh, lecture in video in our library youtube channel to disseminate it to wider society